On today's show, medals are up for grabs at the Games of the Small States of Europe in Montenegro. We find out how cricket is crossing boundaries in Rwanda. We hear the remarkable survival story of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. And the sky's the limit for an 11-year-old skateboarding prodigy. The Games of the Small States of Europe are a unique event. Inaugurated in 1985 by the National Olympic Committees of eight nations in Europe with populations of less than one million, the Games provide these small states with a chance for Olympic glory. Islands such as Cyprus, Malta and Iceland compete alongside landlocked nations Andorra, Liechtenstein and Luxembourg, with Monaco and San Marino also invited. In 2009, Montenegro was added as the ninth nation and made their debut as the hosts for the 18th edition of the event. Former top 30 tennis player and Wimbledon quarter-finalist Gilles Muller is one athlete who has benefited from competing in the Games. I think it's important because obviously not many athletes that are here get the chance to, to play the, the big Olympics and, and, and so for many of them it's kind of a, a highlight of their career, especially for the team sports. Um, tennis has always been a part of it. Um, I remember I played uh, once in 2003 and at that point it was big for me to, to win the gold medal. I think it's good to experience what, what it is to, to be part of, of, a big, uh, of a big team. I mean it's not only about tennis, it's all, also about all the other sports, you see how the other Athletes prepare their, their, their competitions and, and, and you get a feel for what it could be at, at the Rio Olympics. And uh, I think it's a, it's a big motivation for, for the young kids to, to, to be a part of this and then yeah, train harder to, to, to be part of the big Olympics. 846 competitors from the nine small nations travelled to Montenegro to compete for the 113 gold medals on offer across the 10 sports. Igor Vashurovic, Olympic volleyball gold medalist from Sydney 2000, was part of the organising committee for the Games. For us it was a big challenge because this is the biggest multi-sport event in, organised in Montenegro. So we try to promote our history, we promote, try to promote our uh, beautiful country with the five national park, with the deepest canyon in uh, Europe. So we try to, to promote uh, Montenegro in the best way for, for, for these other eight countries. The events were spread across five different towns and cities, meaning the athletes were able to see many of Montenegro's stunning sights. Tourist hotspot Budvar was the central hub for the Games. The town hosted the bull, shooting and tennis. Being just 200 metres from the Adriatic Sea, it was also the ideal location for the beach volleyball. All were within walking distance of the Slovenska Plaza Resort, which acted as the athletes' village. I think we provide them uh, great conditions here because all of these athletes were in the one place. They have a, a restaurant with 900 uh, seats. Uh, the capacity of uh, Slovenska Plaza is uh, almost 2,200 and our idea from the beginning was to uh, promote Olympic spirit, to promote uh, a new friendship and relationship between athletes. Montenegro is a beautiful country and a, a great host and we've been spoiled with the Athlete Village and the great facilities here and uh, the competition is unlike any that I've experienced before and uh, just being in the village and meeting a, a whole bunch of athletes has been really great and the Maltese team have all been uh, very welcoming to me for my first competition so uh, it was great to meet them and great to meet the local people. 40 kilometres south of Budvar is the coastal seaport of Bar. Flanked by the Daenerik Alps and the Adriatic Sea, it's hard to find a more scenic backdrop to host the athletics program. Just across the road from the athletics track in Bar was the basketball arena. North of Budvar and a stone's throw away from the idyllic tourist town of Kotor lies Tivat. This picturesque coastal town situated next to the Bay of Kotor was host to the table tennis competition. 
Montenegro's capital city, Podgorica, was the furthest venue from the athletes' village. The organisers provided regular shuttle buses to all of the venues. Podgorica held the swimming event. En route to Podgorica is the location for the final venue, the old royal capital of Setinje. The historical town played host to the judo competition, where the home nation got the games off to a brilliant start by winning gold in three of the men's events. First, it was Yusuf Nurkovic to win gold in the half lightweight category, before compatriot Nikola Gardashevich secured victory in front of a jubilant home crowd. We'll bring you more action from the games of the small states later in today's show. Now it's time to test your knowledge with our sporting question. Next week, the city of Pattaya in Thailand will host the 2019 Weightlifting World Championships. Amongst the lifters on show will be Kazakhstan's Ilya Ilin. At London 2012, Ilin retained his Olympic title in the 94 kilogram division and set a new world record in the process. However, the 31-year-old was stripped of his two Olympic titles in June 2016, when retests of doping samples presented positive results for the anabolic steroid Stanozolol. Having returned to the sport last year, he will be aiming for a fifth world title, and should he manage that, he will still be some way short of the record number of weightlifting world titles won by one man. And for this week's question, we want you to name who that record-breaking weightlifter is. We'll bring you the answer later in the show. Cricket is a game that has been played around the world for centuries. However, in Rwanda, it's only 18 years old. Many people claim it to be the nation's fastest growing sport and one that has helped towards Rwanda's reconciliation process following the tragic 1994 genocide against the Tutsi people. It's a game that started off the genocide with the, some of the Rwandans that have been living in exile. They count like Uganda, Kenya and Tanzania. And coming back to Rwanda, having been introduced to the game in exile, they also introduced the game in Rwanda. A few students at the National University in Butare, uh, returning from Uganda, just happened to have some equipment with them. So they started to have a knockabout and uh, before they knew it, there was some Indian businessmen in Huye town that had about boys at Butare University playing cricket, and they came to join. Subsequently, a cricket club in the country's capital, Kigali, was formed, and the Rwanda Cricket Association established shortly after. In 2003, Rwanda was affiliated into the International Cricket Council. Eddie Mogarura is the president of the RCA. We managed to spread cricket from Kigali, where it was for the first maybe uh, eight years of its time in Rwanda, to 14 different districts. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable in a space of about 10 years to have the game grow so fast. And uh, just last year, we managed to bring on more than 3,000 new players into the game in just 2018. Until recently, Rwanda's only cricket ground was very bumpy, overused and made of mat. The pitch on the outskirts of Kigali also has a dark past. It was the place where approximately 2,000 Tutsis were massacred during the summer of 1994. Even though the game grown in Inamba, but everyone to play cricket, you had to come in Kichukiro uh, at the old ground. So that was a really a very big challenge. But that was the past, because uh, since Rwanda Cricket Stadium Foundation came in, uh, that became the past and we have a future. The Rwanda Cricket Stadium Foundation, now known as Cricket Builds Hope, is a charity that was founded 10 years ago to build the country's first proper cricket ground. The Gahanga Cricket Stadium, dubbed the Lords of East Africa, officially opened in 2017. As well as having first-class facilities, the space also offers free HIV testing and educational workshops for the local community. 
Former men's national cricket captain Eric Dusingiz Imana was instrumental in the development of Gahanga. I attempted to break the Guinness World Record, raising awareness of cricket in Rwanda, raising money for the construction of the stadium and breaking the Guinness World Record by beating 50 hours from village man, an Indian who are holding that record. And yeah, I battled for 51 hours. Katia Wamahoro also helped to fund Rwanda's new stadium by breaking the Guinness World Record for the longest net session in women's history. The 26-year-old is a leading batswoman for her national side, and she also plays for a charity cricket club who were in action at Gahanga Stadium when Trans World Sport was in town. My ambition is to inspire many girls to play uh, cricket to bring so many girls to know how that they can also do it. There are a number of Rwandans like Katia who are dedicated to the development of their sport. 30-year-old <laughs> Eric Dusabemongo Higwa is one of the nation's top cricketers and also coaches youngsters getting into the game. Eric is also an ambassador for Cricket Without Boundaries, a charity that aims to inspire and empower young people through playing cricket. For the first time when you come, you have to enjoy it only. We, we focus on enjoying when, when they are coming more, so it is where we teach them the technique. We call him Tol Eric. He's the coach, he's the national team captain, and he made a decision to live on the outs uh, outskirts of Kigali simply because he wanted to grow the game. And he's managed to bring about six schools on board single-handedly. Um, he's trained so many girls, about maybe four or six of his girls are playing for the national women's side. Cricket is now played in over 90 schools across Rwanda, with the men and women's game very much on an equal playing field. Former women's national captain Mary Minor has been at the forefront of the game's development. You know, cricket in Rwanda is not even two decades old. So there's that, uh, you know, advantage that cricket was introduced to the men, to the male and the female almost at the very same time. You know, we play with men socially and it's, it's normal. Like we use the same equipment that Eric would use. I would use the same equipment. I would use the same facility and we would try and play at the same time. So there was that boost that boosted a lot of confidence in women's cricket, whose uh, development hiked in a very high rate for the past four years. It was just should, it should in a very high rate, to the point that today, um, this year, the women are, are joining the ICC tournaments for the first time. And it's, it, it, it's quite an improvement. Recently, the Rwandan national men's and women's sides were granted full 2020 international status by the ICC. It's a big step forward in the professional game. For this small, landlocked nation in East Africa, the future of cricket is seemingly bright. I believe one day Rwanda will play the World Cup, but the game is really growing and an ambition is spreading the game far, far from all the region of Rwanda. Maybe if uh, all the sectors had at least a team, that, that would be very good for the development of cricket in Rwanda. A sport in Rwanda is not just a sport, it's more like a lifestyle where people are one big family, massive cricket family. Rwandans have taken to the game, they love it. It seems uh, intrinsically linked to the Rwandan way of life. So I think it's just the right game for Rwanda and uh, maybe in another 10 years, who knows, we'll be talking of Rwanda in the T20 World Cup. Sky and Ocean Brown don't just like to skate together, 
the pair are practically inseparable. Transworld Sport joined the siblings on a trip to Ocean City, New Jersey to find out more about the skateboarding prodigies. Three words I'll describe Ocean are naughty, funny, ha fun, happy, happy. And fun. <laughs> I was like skating these stairs in Tokyo and this woman went up to me and said like, get out, don't, you can't do that. Skateboarding is dangerous, you can't do it. You're gonna ruin the stairs. And then Ocean, like he, she literally like pushed me. So, and then Ocean went, he, he did the, did I say it? He did the middle finger too. <laughs> yeah, he always like look after me, thank you. <laughs> so I skate with Ocean like a lot and he just like makes it like fun and like we like can teach each other like different like, cause we both do different tricks. So it's like, he can teach me like some tricks and I can teach him some tricks. Oh my gosh, Ocean, Ocean, right now you're coming like this. You need to come, you need to come like this. This way's better. Yeah, that was, that was good. Despite her age, Skye's already one of the best female skateboarders in the world. In 2019, she has already competed in Europe, Asia, and South America, as well as at the prestigious X Games. So this year, I went to Estonia for simple sessions, and then I went to England in Manchester for the British champs, and then I went to California in Long Beach for Du Tour, and then I went to Nanjing, China for the world champs. And then I went to the X Games. And watch this. The frontside 540 again. Rodeo into the kickflip to Fakey, hanging on. At the X Games, I did a frontside 540. Well, I was the first girl to do a frontside 540 at the X Games. And I didn't really care if I win or lose. I just wanted to like do like the tricks that not really any girls are doing and kind of like push the limits. For the next contest, I'm practicing a blow for pout, which is where you go on to the to the like coping like the ramp like this, and you kick flip out. It's a pretty hard trick, but like I like I said, I kind of want to like push the limits and go like do these crazy tricks that boys are doing. Then the next one is a frontside flip. It's where you do a frontside ollie, but you flip it and then you go. On. So yeah, those are two. Those two are pretty hard. And then the next one is it's like what I did, like where I go to blunt fakey, then I go front blunt out, like a frontside 180 out. It, they're all three of them are pretty hard, but I want to push the limit. Next year sees skateboarding make its Olympic debut in Sky's native Japan. However, thanks to her English father, Sky is eligible to compete for Team GB in Tokyo. So I might go to the Olympics next year and I'm gonna compete for Great Britain. Well, like, we weren't gonna do Olympics because my parents thought it was too much pressure. But then, like, Lucy added, like, this, like, the boss of, well, like, the skateboarding, like, well, she's from Team GB. She said that, like, there's no pressure, just get out there and have fun. And that's the kind of way I skate. Like, I have fun, but I would try my best, but. And um, so basically, we'll talk it every morning, 
And then my dad, my parents were like, I guess you could do it. Like, it'll be crazy if I do it. Like, that was kind of part of it. Skateboarding is one of the fastest growing sports for participation, with an increasing number of young girls taking up the sport. That's why I want to do the Olympics, because I feel like if I go out there and if they see me like this little girl doing this, maybe I can do it too. It like, doesn't even have to be skateboarding. Just get out there, have fun, be brave, and do it because you love it. We're back in Montenegro for the games of the small states of Europe, the mini Olympics for countries in Europe with fewer than a million people. It's an event that provides seasoned competitors with a chance of glory and offers a valuable experience for the stars of tomorrow. The poster girl for the 2019 games was high jumper Maria Vukovic. The 27-year-old became Montenegro's first world champion in athletics at any level when winning the world junior title in 2010. Despite the torrential rain in Bar, Maria cleared 1 meter 86 to win her fifth consecutive gold medal at the Games. Another star on show was Bob Bertemez of Luxembourg. The 26-year-old is one of the world's leading shot putters, but found himself behind for most of the competition. Saving the best until last, Bob threw a new Games record of 20.57 meters to secure victory. There was another Games record in the men's 5,000 metres, courtesy of Malta's Jordan Gussman. Born and raised in Australia, Jordan recently switched nationalities to represent his grandfather's country of Malta. Grandpa Frank passed away shortly after the Games due to ill health, but was able to see his grandson race in the colours of Malta. 25-year-old Jordan also picked up silver in the 1500 and gold in the 10,000 metres. Going really well. Coach obviously set a few goals for me. One of them was basically to come here and run the three events over the three days and uh, we don't get too many opportunities to, to practice the rounds uh, of these competitions so that was basically just to test how my legs would feel after 5k uh, and how well I backed up. Um, so I wanted to give the 5k a little bit of a go and I, I think I I made it honest enough where my legs were pretty tired and I ended up winning the 5k in uh, 14 flat. And then the 10K obviously came back today and uh, ran 29.49. I think we started a little bit slower and picked up towards the end. So uh, overall, I think it was a good three days of racing and um, I think my coach will be happy. Over in the men's high jump, there was a changing of the guard between 35-year-old world and Commonwealth medalist Kiriako Ianu of Cyprus and his 17-year-old compatriot Kiriako Pampaka. The teenager cleared a personal best of 2 meters 12 at the first attempt, forcing his more experienced rival to skip to 2.15 meters. And when Ianu failed at that height, Pampaka completed the upset. These games are perfect for young sports stars to familiarize themselves with the procedures of a multi-sport event. One of the stars in the pool, Julia Hassler, made her international debut at these games as a 14-year-old. When I was younger, I looked up to the older ones and now I'm like an older one. So I think, I hope that I can also motivate younger ones to keep doing and that they also can compete in Europeans and World Championships and also can achieve like bigger things than only like making a medal at small nation games. Last year, the 26-year-old from Liechtenstein made three finals at the European Championships and here in Podgorica came home with an impressive six gold medals. It's always nice to swim for a country and I think for small countries it's like a difference to compete, compete in this event because it's like a big thing because we don't have so many chances in like the Olympics. So it's always nice to come back to this competition and try to do the best for my country. We'll be back later with our final instalment from the Games.
The latest in our series of training tips comes from seven-time Grand Slam winner, Jamie Murray. Today, he teaches us all about the eye formation. So people use the eye formation as a way to stress out the returner, to confuse them about where the server's partner is moving to, and it's another way to try to you know, force your opponent into making mistakes, take their eye off the ball, um, force them to go for low risk shots by having to play more returns down the line, um, because more often than not, the, it forces the service partner to be in the, in the middle of the court. Um, so, I mean, there's a few ways of doing it for stance. Um, me personally, I kind of stand like here, but some people I see kind of doing crouched, even like sometimes one leg behind the other, but it's totally up to you. It's just personal preference. Um, so one thing that's really important using the affirmation is to disguise the movement. Um, so I'm going to show you how, how to do that. So the green cones here are basically for a wide serve. Um, if I'm coming to this cone here, it's because I'm not poaching. And if I come to this cone here, it's because I'm poaching off my partner's wide serve. But the way to disguise the, the move is to move forward first and then cut to the relevant cone. So for example, if my partner is gonna serve wide and I'm not going to poach, I'm gonna come forward first so that my opponent doesn't know which way I'm gonna go. And then I'm gonna cut to this position here. If I'm poaching, I'm going to start here and I'm going to move forward and then I'm going to cut to this position, to this cone and again I'm going to have my outside foot on the middle line. For eye formation, T-serve, we've got the yellow cones out. I'm going to show you the move that I do for a T-serve and no poach. So I'm going to be down here, I'm going to come up, I'm going to put my foot on the line and then I'm going to shift across and that's going to help disguise the move. For a T-serve and a poach, I'm going to be down again. I'm going to bring my foot forward onto the line and then I'm going to shift across. So my opponent really should never be able to read the move that I'm trying to make. Okay, so in summing up the eye formation, it's a great way to create uncertainty amongst your opponents, to be unpredictable in your patterns of play. And if you're playing against a guy who's a really good receiver's partner and is putting a lot of pressure on your first volley, it's a good way to force your opponents to hit down the line so you can come in and play a first volley down the line without feeling the pressure of the guy uh, on top of the net and forcing you to play into uh, smaller areas of the court. And now for the answer to this week's sporting question. Earlier, we asked you to name the man who's won the most weightlifting world titles. The answer is Russia's Vasily Alexeyev, who won eight consecutive gold medals in the super heavyweight division between 1970 and 1977. The son of a lumberjack, Alexeyev spent most of his childhood years working as an apprentice woodcutter in southern Russia. At the age of 18, he started weightlifting and went on to enjoy an illustrious two-decade-long career, during which he claimed two Olympic gold medals and set 80 world records. He was also the first man to break the iconic 500-pound barrier in the clean and jerk. Following his retirement in 1980, Alexeyev entered politics and had a short spell as coach of the Soviet national weightlifting team. Vasily Alexeyev passed away in 2011, aged 69.
today, a chartered aircraft carrying a Uruguayan rugby team has been found 72 days after it went down in the Andes. Ha sido encontrado hoy tras 72 días. All of the passengers were given up for dead. Habían sido dados por muertos. Ayer, dos supervivientes. Two survivors of the crash stumbled into a small town in Chile yesterday. Un helicóptero ha sido enviado esta mañana. This morning, a helicopter has been sent to recover another 14 survivors still in the mountains. It has already been labeled one of the most incredible survival stories in recent times. Se dice que es una de las más increíbles historias de supervivencia de todos los tiempos. Será conocido para siempre como el milagro de los Andes. It will be forever known as the miracle in the Andes. Mi nombre My name is Gustavo Zabino. I played across the back line for the Old Christians Rugby Club. My name is Nando, is Nando Parado. Parado. I played as a lock for the Old Christians Rugby Club. My name is Antonio Vizintin. I was a prop for the Old Christians Rugby Club. I'm a survivor of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. I'm a survivor of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. I'm a survivor of Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. The Old Christians Rugby Club are one of the biggest rugby union teams in Uruguay. With 18 league titles, they've clinched more domestic trophies than all but one team in the country and they've had several players represent the national team. Founded in 1962, the Old Christians had twice won the national championship by the end of their first decade. The club was pretty new when I played. We were always battling at the top, either first or second in the championship. At that time in my life, the priorities were rugby, rugby, education and family, in that order of importance. Forty-five years ago, the old Christians chartered a plane to take them from Carrasco Airport in the Uruguayan capital of Montevideo to Santiago in Chile for an exhibition match. They invited their family members and friends to join them on the trip. Expectations were high. I'd never been to Chile or even seen snow. En route to the airport, we joked about traveling on the unluckiest day of the year, Friday the 13th. But we boarded the plane and forgot about it. Due to bad weather, the plane had to make a stop in Argentina. However, when the team restarted their journey, the conditions had hardly improved. The journey became rough, with lots of turbulence. The plane was shaking up and down, a lot. It wasn't fun. I got very frightened, especially when the plane suddenly dropped from a height due to the strong winds. The pilot had to speed up to avoid crashing against the summit of the mountain. We realized the situation wasn't positive at all. I couldn't believe what my eyes were seeing. The engines were making very loud noises too, and then the crash. I remember the impact itself, the noise of the open air, the sensation of the plane falling from the sky. The last thing I remember is the sound of the metal hitting the mountain. After that, there was just darkness. I thought I was dead. It was pure desperation. There were people trapped inside the crushed seats. Initially, you think, I'm alive, but then you need to escape. 
I'd studied medicine for three months at college, and I started figuring out who was alive and who was dead. Roberto and I began treating as many people as we could. They cut open my jacket, and it was very heavy with blood. It looked as though I had a piece of liver growing on my elbow, but it was all clotted blood. I could have died. In the harsh conditions in which they found themselves, medical students Gustavo Zerbino and Roberto Canessa attempted to treat the injured passengers. The other survivors cleared the fuselage of dead bodies and barricaded the opening with bags to insulate it. I don't remember anything from the first four days. I was in a coma, just darkness. I could have died and I wouldn't have known. Initially given up for dead, Nando regained consciousness in the Andes a few days after the crash. He learned that his good friend Panchito, with whom he had swapped seats midway through the flight, had not survived, nor had his mother. His sister Susie died a matter of days later in his arms. I still don't know what mourning is. The need for survival was so serious and important that I never had the time nor the capacity to cry. I desperately wanted to cry, to suffer, to grieve my mother's death. I did manage to bury the bodies with the help of my friends, but I couldn't cry, and that annoyed me. Despite the devastation, the group were optimistic that they'd soon be found. In the meantime, they had to find ways to survive. They made sleeping bags out of the aircraft seats and a device to melt snow for drinking water. However, when their food supplies ran out, they had to turn to extreme measures. Hunger is the most primitive fear man can experience. We needed to eat, and the only source of food were the corpses of our friends. First of all, it was unpleasant, sickening even. But as the days went by, it became the most normal thing to do in the world, and we didn't talk about it anymore. We realized that we would have starved to death in a few days if we didn't eat anything. We all made a pact. Each one of us offered their body if it meant the others would survive. It was similar to a communion. Like Christ in the communion, we were offering our bodies to each other. You missed those that had died as they were important in your life, but you recognized that you were alive thanks to them. As the weeks went past here, more passengers died. An avalanche hit which claimed eight lives. However, several started to die from hunger or the injuries they'd sustained in the crash. Seeing their teammates, their friends perish was tough for those left and a reminder of their own mortality. It was a horrible sensation. It was a feeling of complete loneliness, a really unsettling feeling. You felt devastated, and you didn't know if you yourself would survive. I saw what was coming, and I didn't like it. My brothers were those boys in the mountains with me. My world was not millions of people. It was just those 16 of us left alive. Despite the awful situation in which they found themselves, the rugby players among the group tried to keep morale high by sharing memories of their time with the old Christians. There was a real sense of togetherness and a determination to survive, traits they felt they owed to their sport. Without rugby players up there, nobody would have survived. We had all been steeped in rugby from a young age. Through it, we learned respect for others and the concept of teamwork. In the Andes, we created a community of solidarity. Everything we had up there was shared with everyone else. 
that rugby education and character formation was extremely important in us achieving our common objective of leaving that place alive. However, that hope of survival was dealt a blow when one of the group managed to get a transistor radio from the cockpit working. The survivors discovered that the search for them had been called off. That was a horrendous emotion to feel. Everyone was deeply hit by that, because we realized that the rest of the world thought we were dead. I didn't want to die there. I tried to get my head around it, but I just thought I was in purgatory. The bad news was that the search for us had been suspended. The good news was from that moment on, whether we lived or died depended solely on us. The remaining passengers knew that their only hope of escaping the mountains alive was by seeking help themselves. Despite being unaware of their exact location, Antonio Vizintin, Roberto Canessa, and Nando Parado started to trek through the snow. I knew I had to leave. I knew being there did not have to signal the end. They said that the time had come and that they would gladly sacrifice their lives to help their friends. I look back now and I cannot understand how a man like me, full of fear, came to make that decision because the chances were stacked against me. The moment I left the safety of that group and that plane, I shouldn't have survived. I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. Antonio had to drop back due to exhaustion, but Nando and Roberto carried on for 10 days and 54 kilometers. They came across a farmer riding on horseback by a stream. He notified the emergency services. Just over 10 weeks after being in a fatal air disaster, Nando Parado then boarded the rescue helicopter to locate his friends. During our time in the mountains, there were moments of total horror that you cannot possibly describe. But the magical moment was when we saw the muleteer. It was the first spark of life. We could hear the sounds of a helicopter. It was that recognizable sound. And we knew that we were going back home. We would see our families again. When I was being lifted into the helicopter, I felt a bittersweet emotion. Sadness because we were leaving the place which had become our home, our world, the place where our friends sadly perished. But I also felt happiness because I was about to see the world once more when I thought I was dead. I was going to see my family. I came back. I was reborn and I realized that I needed to make the most of this life. Today, I can tell you that I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful of having lived 45 more years. I have two children, three grandchildren, and that's very important to me. Being back with my family is the most important thing. My family are my world now. Now for our final instalment from the 2019 Games of the Small States of Europe. Montenegro hosted the 18th edition of this unique event, but it was Luxembourg who finished on top of the medals table, thanks in part to swimmer Raphael Stacchiotti. 
already the most successful competitor in the history of the Games, Raphael was aiming for nine gold medals in Podgorica. He was pushed all the way by Kolbein Krafum Kelsen in the 50 meter backstroke. The race was declared a dead heat with the pair sharing the gold medal. Eight out of eight so far, bringing Raphael's overall tally to an astonishing 40 gold medals. However, in the final race of the competition, Iceland upset the favourites Luxembourg in the men's 4x100 metre medley relay. It was the last one, the, uh, the, the pretty... Uh, it was a tough one, the relay, the medley relay was tough, but uh, the Icelandic guys were just stronger this time, and uh, well, we come back stronger in two years and then we get that back. As a 16-year-old, Raphael was the youngest flag bearer for Luxembourg at the Olympic Games in 2008. And now, aged 27, he recently qualified for his fourth successive Olympics. But it was the small games that were the start for him. I started out in 2007 with this event, so uh, it definitely helps to, to see what it is like the Olympic feeling, even if it's not the real Olympics. but. Uh, you just kind of have the feeling with medal ceremonies and how you uh, with the, the national anthems and uh, all the, the doping controls and uh, the, the older ones leading the team and that's kind of cool. So uh, you learn a lot by it and uh, you grow by it and that's uh, how I managed to do it last 12 years. At the other end of the medals table, Andorra won their first gold of the games courtesy of track star Paul Moya. The 22-year-old, who has competed in the Olympics as a teenager, won the 800-meter gold. Andorra will host the next edition of the Games of the Small States in 2021, and they picked up another gold medal in the pool, thanks to 22-year-old Nadia Tudo, who won the 100-meter breaststroke title. Finishing just behind Andorra in ninth place on the medals table was San Marino. They went into the last event of the athletics program having not won a gold medal in any event at the Games. When favourite Cyprus dropped the baton in the men's 4x100 metre relay, it left Luxembourg in the lead. And when they failed their final changeover, San Marino overhauled Montenegro for a fairy tale victory. It would be their only gold of the Games. Basketball is one of the most popular sports in Montenegro and here the home team delivered. The hosts went undefeated during the round robin competition as both the men's and women's teams claimed gold. There was more success for Montenegro on the final day of competition. Vladica Babic saved six match points to come back from a set down to win the women's singles title in the tennis. The president of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, was guest of honour for the closing ceremony. Montenegro were presented with their basketball gold medals, which raised them to fifth place on the medals table. As the flame was being extinguished, it was time to reflect on a successful week for the organising committee. It was a pity in the first two days because we have unusual weather conditions for Montenegro, but. At the end, we have three or four days sun in a row, so everybody's smiling. And uh, at the end, all of our guests were uh, happy and satisfied with their with their uh, presentation here in Montenegro. Mm -hmm.